I can tell you more about Dire Straits, but I was basically just a second keyboard guy to Alan Clark, who um, is an excellent guy, super nice guy. Well, I got to say that my I love I never heard Sultans of Swing the live version until two years ago, and it was oh. I just it's phenomenal. I mean, I love the keyboards in it, and then it goes in, you know the solo goes from the keyboards, and it goes to the guitar. I mean, yeah, that's just I I just I just think it's just phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mark had a lot to live up to because the the records were very uh, spare, and now he had a big band, lights, and and big audience in Europe. Uh, and that really want and Australia that really wanted to hear it stretched out. So and he was into it. He had just done a, a movie soundtrack or two, Local Hero he did, and um, yeah, so I wasn't allowed to play on that song till about four or five minutes into it because well, where were they coming from? Just a guitar quartet, and then they had to work Alan in, and Alan Clark has great keyboard parts, and so I just would jump around there. So we played it for the Prince one year and Lady Di and Peter Townsend was the uh, MC. He was the guy that introduced everyone. Cool. And afterwards he came up to me and said, uh, well, I, you know, you jump around so much. You kind of put me off, but your wife, but, but my wife liked it. He, he said his wife liked it. That's but I was just said. jumping around because I couldn't play. They were like, don't play yet, don't play yet. And they were right, you know, but what am I supposed to do up there? You know? <laughs> so I look at it now, I'm like, ooh, cringe, you know, but it's a good arrangement, yeah. <laughs> you know the part where um, it sounds like Alan plays something and Mark hears it and then he echoes it and plays it? And the and solo of something? Right? Yeah, solo yeah. of something to swing. Yeah, 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 right. Totally, totally rehearsed. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mark, I shouldn't have said that. But after all these years, yeah, I'm sure you'll forgive me. Wow, but it's cool though. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Yeah, he's, he's a genius. I mean, you really have worked on some landmark albums. I mean, Combat Rock, you were on that with The Clash. Yeah, that's, be that's through Ian Hunter, uh, because when, I, when Mick Jones was producing Ian Hunter's, uh, the second Ian record that I played on, Short Back and Sides, which is some kind of British term for a haircut, certain kind of haircut. <laughs> and Mick Jones was producing it. So I had this Kumar synthesizer and I could get all those boo boo sounds and stuff. And so when he was doing the Clash record, actually he hired me before that to play on one of his, uh, the ladies that he was uh, producing in the, there was a group called the B Girls. And he had me play some on that with that synthesizer. So then when Clash was needed, needed some sort of keyboard stuff, did you know that on, on uh, Rock the Kasbah, Almost every instrument on that is played by Topper, the drummer, uh, on a break or something. He played, he played, I think the piano, he played, I think he played everything except for the jet fighter. Wow, I don't even know. But he, he played almost everything on that. He was wow. a really good guy. He played on the, some of those Ian Hunter sessions. Out of all the people you've played with, I mean, what are the standouts for you that you really enjoyed? Um, well, I got to audition for Steve Winwood once. Cool. If I had gotten that gig, I wouldn't have been on the Alchemy album because we were taking a break. We did like three month, two or three months in England and Europe. Then we were on a break while Mark produced uh, Dylan's Infidels album at Power Station. Then we were supposed to meet up again in April or something and go to Australia, New Zealand and Japan. And sometime in January or February, I got a call. Steve Wynn was looking for a keyboard player. Eric Parker, the drummer from, from uh, Ian Hunter and Little Feet was uh, in the band. And I knew some of the other guys. So they were like going. So I got to meet Steve Winwood, my hero. And he was staying in Bette Midler's loft downtown at the time and came down one of those little one man elevators, picked me up and went up to the loft and said, play something. So I started playing and he walks out of the room and like, Ugh, I must have played something wrong, but he was just making tea, you know? So then he came back and we jammed for a time. It was really fun. And then we were in Amsterdam with I, when I was back with Straight, and I went out with Steve and Eric and some of the other guys in their band, just went out and hung out. Wait, you're hanging out with Steve and Winwood and Eric Clapton? No, Eric Parker, but Eric, Eric, Clapton. Clapton, Eric Clapton came to the Dire Straits gig in, uh, I think it was not Manchester, it was uh, Birmingham, I think. Uh, and he was in the dressing room before and I asked him to sign a, a, a coaster and he said, oh, you Americans are all the same. But he laughed, you know, he was a super nice guy. Then later on, uh, Roger Waters was playing in town at, at the Radio City Music Hall and Paul, uh, who was one of the promoters for Dire Straits, recognized me and got me backstage afterwards. And Eric was there with Richard Manuel from the band. <laughs> Cool. They said, come on, come on, we're going to Cafe Luxembourg for an after party, you know? So you also 
also have got you got a quite several solo albums out there. You, just, you had your first one out in 1984, right? Here's here's my career breakdown. Okay, my solo stuff. Uh, I tried to be an, a solo artist, got signed to Epic, that didn't happen. Then I was a sideman for many years. I wrote a couple of rock operas, one got optioned for Broadway, but those didn't turn out to be commercial successes. So I ended up being pretty successful as a sideman. I would say mostly that's what I've done. But in the 80s, after Dire Straits, I bought a 24 track, two inch tape machine, uh, and I had it in my apartment and um, I recorded a lot of stuff. Also couldn't get a deal, but eventually I started um, releasing the stuff on CD Baby. Uh, and they'd get it in the Apple store, they'd get it on Amazon Music, Microsoft, whatever, you know, they'd get it out there. It's before Spotify. But, um, so I had good digital distribution. I did like 11 CDs. Some were of me singing my songs. Some were uh, kind of progressive stuff. Some of it was just instrumentals, trying to be more, a little like Quincy Jones, but maybe being a little more like Flock of Seagulls, maybe, uh, meets Kenny G. But those are both groups that, that you probably don't like, but it was somewhere in there. A little more Peter Gabriel, if you, if you really give me a, the benefit of the doubt, <laughs> but not as good a singer. So anyway, what happened was in 1981 uh, uh, or two, my ex-wife, who was the studio manager, and her partner, Wayne Vulcan, who owned the studio and was engineering and producing, uh, put out a four-song EP, 1981 of me, called Tommy Mandel, and it turned out one song from it became a disco, uh, a hit in the clubs in New York. So this record now is selling for a uh, hundred bucks or something, you know, and I, we hardly have any left. So what are you, what's in your uh, future? My future is divided between four things, I would say. One is being a grandfather. It's, I work at Sarah Lawrence College, uh, accompanying theater classes, which I've done. I did it in the 70s for six years, and then I started again in 2000. Two days a week, accompanying like 10 students. Then I, I'm still doing music. It goes into two streams. One, I do a lot of live streams on Facebook. I just sit down at the piano and start playing, like I used to do at the Empire Diner. For many years, I played uh, solo piano at the Empire Diner, like late at night. You know, it was, it was a paying gig, but it was mostly just drink as much coffee as you can and play as many songs at the same time as possible. Well, I really appreciate you talking with uh, Music Explorer today, Tom. Thanks, Dan. It was really nice talking to you and a nice thanks for hooking me up with all your fans. And I hope you guys all have a great year. All right, thank you, Tom.